Joe Biden is now officially president of the United States. He, of course, ran and won on a message of restoring the soul of the nation. But what does that actually mean? That's right. So joining us now is Reverend Dr. William Barber. He's president of Repairs of the Breach and the National Co-Chair for the Poor People's Campaign. Reverend, thanks so much for joining us, sir. We really appreciate it. Blessings to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So tell us a little bit about you're going to be speaking with the president momentarily um, at this inaugural prayer breakfast. Just to, what are some of the things that you would like to see in order to accomplish your vision of the Poor People's Campaign under this new president of the United States? Well, today it is the interfaith um, um, inaugural prayer service and worship service. It's actually a preaching service, a president and to the nation happens about every four years. I'll be live streamed from the National Cathedral. And as we talk about the healing of the soul of the nation, you know, scripture is pretty clear and even our constitution that the healing of the soul requires the healing of the body, the sickness in the body. And we know that there are five interlocking injustices or sicknesses that trouble the soul of this nation, systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation slash the denial of health care, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. And so um, um, when I speak preach this morning, I'm preaching from a text, an Old Testament text that's honored by Muslims and Christians and Jews that, that actually lays out what to do <laughs> when you've been through a crisis, narcissistic leadership, lying leadership, greedy leadership, it says that to repair the nation, you must lift from the bottom. To prepare for the nation, you must deal with unfair practices. So what we're saying, have said to them is, is in this moment, uh, we need to see living wages that will fix, help the body. We need to deal with systemic racism in all of its form. Uh, from police brutality, but also towards, uh, we need immigrant justice. We need to deal with our native indigenous people and treating them fairly. We need health, expansion of health care. Uh, we need to fix the Voting Rights Act that has been held up from being fixed for over 2,600 days since 2013. We need infrastructure development in the poor, low wealth communities that will lift the whole nation. In other words, we need to lift from the body, from the bottom, and end unfair practices. And if you do that, not that you can repair the soul because you will have dealt with the sickness in the body. Reverend, can you elaborate on, you said the, the fifth sickness was, I think you described it as a false religious nationalism. Can you just expand on that? Well, this is the kind of religious nationalism we have seen that makes an, an idol out of one person that that folk that tries to use religion to justify hate to justify isolation to justify saying that america is better than anyone else and doesn't have to care about anyone else the kind of false nationalism that tends to lead itself also into uh, the sinful realities of racism and ideas of supremacy and what we saw the other day at the Capitol was what always inevitably happens whenever you seed and feed division based in race and based in class and ideas of supremacy. It has always ended in violence. Um, you know, you saw people the other day on the Senate floor when they broke in um, to the White House, I mean, to the Capitol, talk, praying, uh, trying to justify their hate in religious terms. That is a form of theological malpractice at best and heresy at worst. But we didn't just, it didn't just happen with Trump. Trump may have lit the gasoline this time. George Wallace lit the gasoline in the 60s and others have lit it. But the gasoline of division was poured out. Uh, we saw it happen with Richard Nixon with the Southern strategy. They came up with a deliberate plan to divide the nation, to divide. They actually said, we're going to divide the nation and we're going to use, it's going to, that division will come from the corporate suites, the political offices and pulpits. Um, it's the kind of religious nationalism that tries to justify the Klan, justifies racism, justifies hate. And it is very dangerous because what it does not do is deal with the actual fundamental uh, foundations of faith, which are love and truth and grace and mercy and, and justice and treating your neighbor right, 
uh, and lifting a nation from the bottom. The Bible is clear. It is very clear as, uh, that nations are judged by how they treat the least of these when it comes to the precepts of God. So Reverend, well, something I've always appreciated about your work is your emphasis about healing the class divide in our country. One of the things that we've been talking a lot here about on the show recently is a crisis of, I, I mean, almost quasi-religiousness that we see um, in a lot of people who believed in Trump, not necessarily in terms of his political agenda, but as kind of this like mythological figure, as you referred to, you know, almost QAnon type religious belief. How do you get out of that? As a country, I mean, it's not, you know, many of these people are secular or at least, you know, in terms of their own religious practice, it's not like they are attending services or anything. What can, what can we do as a nation? Well, you know, it's actually strange that in this nation, moments of pain have actually led to our deliverance from this kind of thinking. First of all, we have to acknowledge that this is not the first time we've seen uh, what someone like Trump has done. Uh, it, it has a deep history. Uh, it's it's un-American based on our constitutional values, but it's not non-American. But but what I've been thinking about this. Um, there is something called death pangs, P-A-N-G-S, and there's something called birth pains. And over and over in our history, moments that we thought might be death pangs turned into be birth pains. For instance, the Civil War was a death. It seemed to be, a, it was deadly. But out of that came the birthing of the Reconstruction Movement. And a lot of people's minds were changed. The assassination of Abraham Lincoln was a horrible death pain. But it turned into a birth pain of, of the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. The Great Depression and after the Gilded Age and after a, a, a pandemic, was a death pain, but it turned into birth pains of the New Deal and and uh, opening up the military uh, with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the Civil Rights Movement. If you think about it, George Wallace segregation yesterday, today, and tomorrow, the death of Kennedy, the death of four little girls in the church were death pains, but it turned into birth pains of new ideas of freedom. And so one of the things we have to do is claim this moment as a moment of birth pains. And, 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 and how do we get people changed? What, what, what if in this moment we pass a, implement a full and just comprehensive COVID relief and people see that the extremism may lie to you, but it won't help your life? What if we lift 140 million people who were poor and low up before COVID, 8 million more after COVID since May out of poverty? What if we raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour and help 62 million people and 39 million families? What if we, what if we open up health care for 80 million people who are uninsured or underinsured? What if this very moment of so much pain, many pains, it actually turns to pain, birth pains, and we institute a third reconstruction and we lift those from Appalachia to Alabama, California to the Carolinas, Michigan to Mississippi, the, the fields of Kentucky to the mountains of, I mean, the mountains of Kentucky to the fields of Kansas, that could actually change people's minds. What if we say this is not a moment of liberal uh, and, and, and conservative or centrist or Republican or Democrat? What if this, uh, President Biden said yesterday, enough of us? Remember, he talked about unity, but he also said the other day, what if enough of us embrace establishing justice? Our Constitution says the only way to ensure domestic tranquility is to start with the establishment of justice. That's the Constitution. And what if we take that seriously and enough of us believe it? All of these death pangs, these things that are trying to undermine and destroy the democracy might actually become birth pains that birth us into a deeper expression of democracy and toward a more perfect union. It has happened before, and I believe it can happen, and it will happen this time. It has happened before, and of course, nothing is, is ultimately inevitable. It requires struggle, it requires good people to come together in service of that work. How will you be, and how should we be, judging the work of this administration? Well, we have put out a 14 point first 50, first 100 day agenda um, saying to call for the healing of the nation, 
saying that if we're going to heal, it has to be more than kumbaya and nice words and, ha and pats on the back. It must be policy that lifts from the bottom, that proves that everybody has a right to live. And so we'll be measuring the administration this way, but not just measuring, we're going to be helping. Uh, we're going to start Moral Mondays again in February, every Monday, thousands of people around issues and calling legislators and Congress people and pushing them because Biden and Harris can't do it alone. Uh, we're planning now for a mass Poor People's Assembly Moral March on Washington as soon as COVID releases us. We did it last year virtually and 2.7 million people showed up because people want to, to their issues to be addressed. You know, 73% of Republicans want um uh, health care. 60 some percent of Republicans want living wages. We must show people a public policy way out. And what we're going to do is every piece of public policy, we're going to lay the Constitution on, on, on top of it and say, does it establish justice? Does it provide for the common defense? Does it promote the general welfare? Does it um, guarantee equal protection under the law? And then we're going to lay our deepest religious values on top of it. Is it rooted in love and justice and mercy and grace? and truth. And that's how we're going to judge whether it's a good piece of public policy or a bad piece of public policy. And we've asked the president when we met with the domestic team, when you put a policy forward like his COVID relief, go before the people and say, if this passes, this is how many black people will be helped. This is how many white people will be helped. This is how many Latinos will be helped. This is how many people in Appalachia will be helped. This is how many people in Alabama. Tell the people what that policy will do. That's the way you undermine the lies of extremism that will quickly say, this is radical, this is socialism. Undercut that by actually laying the truth out before the people. And I bet you, we will find enough, enough people, enough people who want this nation to ultimately be one nation, indivisible with liberty and justice for all and under God. Reverend Barber, we know that you have a very busy day and we are so grateful for you making some time for us. Thank you so much. Great to see you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Of course. And we'll have more rising for you after this.